I'm starting to realize how conditioned we are into believing how limited we are. Mm -hmm. And as you start peeling those layers away and you break through those beliefs, those self-limiting thoughts and emotions, on the other side of that is where the miraculous happens. Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness podcast. We have the legendary Dr. Joe Dispenza in the house. Hey. My man. The last Sorry. interview we did uh, took over the world, took over the internet, over a million views on YouTube in less than 10 months. The audio is in the top 10 of all of our, our podcasts ever out of 800-something episodes. So people need the information that you have, and there's a reason um, that you're so effective with your work, and there's, there's so many transformations in your work. And we were just talking before about how people are literally transformed when they read your books, when they listen to interviews like this with you, when they go through week-long workshops of some of the crazy stuff that you do. And I was asking you, you know, why is this stuff really taking off now in the last year, year and a half? Mm -hmm. Because you've been doing this work for a couple of decades <clears throat> now, right? Yeah. Two decades? Yeah, just about, yeah. Almost two decades. And... You've been in tons of documentaries, movies, you've been in doing interviews for a long time, but really it's taken off in the last year. And you said, because now we have evidence of about a lot of things that you're working on. Mm -hmm. The things that you've been believing for so many years that you knew worked for you, and you saw transformation with yourself. We're not gonna go into your accident because that's in the last interview. Um, but now we have proof and evidence and science backing all this. And how did that start to happen? Yeah. It's a, it's a great dialogue because um, I think this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. Mm. This is a time in history to know how. And <clears throat> if you rewind the tape 10 years ago, you know, information was the thing that stimulated thought, stimulated new ideas. And, and as we learn new things, we make new connections in our brains. So <clears throat> as we begin to add new stitches into that three-dimensional tapestry in our mind, we're beginning to cause our mind to function in new ways. But the key then is to apply it, to personalize it, to do something with it. And, and 10 years ago, when I went out, got in front of an audience and talked about the application, it, it, nobody wanted to step outside that philosophical, theoretical, intellectual realm, right? Because when doing something means you're going to have to change something about yourself. Painful. Yeah, you're going to get uncomfortable, yeah. right? And um, <clears throat> I think we're in an age of information. And in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. And because of technology, we have access to so much content and information creates awareness, and awareness is consciousness, and you can't have consciousness without energy. They're, they work together. So there's an energetic change, I think, that's taking place in the world right now where people are so informed that old models, old paradigms are beginning to break down, mm -hmm. whether it's the medical model or the religious model, the education model, journalism, uh, the, the economy, you know, um, politics. It's all beginning to... Uh, come to the surface because something else has to come out. And, and I think that one of the things that uh, people are realizing is that you don't have to be a Buddhist monk to do this or <laughs> a, a nun with 40 years of devotion. You just gotta understand the formula. And just like any skill or anything you learn, you gotta go from thinking to doing to being. You gotta take knowledge, you, you create the experience, and if you keep doing it over and over again, you start getting a skill or you start getting wise about how to do it. And you, you know that you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, in the last 10 years, we have assembled a scientific team, and let's see if you can really make significant brain changes. I, I don't want those changes to just be in your mind. I want them to be in your brain. I want to be able to see before and after pictures to mm -hmm. say, that person has a significant change after a traumatic brain injury, or anxiety, or depression, or a cyclic mood disorder, or a stroke. We want to see that there's been significant change. At the same time, let's measure your brain in real time and let's look to see what that transformation process looks like. Mm. And in the discovery, Lewis, of that process, we gained so much knowledge about what that transformational process looks like. Right. In other words, I can tell you without a doubt that if you're analyzing your life right now within some disturbing emotion, that 100% of the time you're going to make your brain worse. If you Be think about your life, 
if you're stuck in an emotion, oh, like you're frustrated, yeah, you're yeah. angry, you're fearful, resentful, resentful, and you're thinking within that emotional state. In other words, mm -hmm. you can't think greater than how you feel. That means then you were thinking in the past because those emotions are a record or residue of the past. So we see people in the, in the process of change that are analyzing in, uh, in, in duality or polarity. That kind of drives the brain into higher states of arousal mm. and, and further away from true change. Mm. So we did, uh, we've done thousands and thousands and thousands of brain scans and, and we now know that there's a formula to create greater brain coherence, greater brain efficiency, to make your brain work better. And when mm. your brain works better, you work better. At the same time, it requires a clear intention and an elevated emotion to begin to change your energy and to change your life. And nobody changes until they change their energy, right? right. So then how do you get a person out of resentment and frustration into joy and freedom if why would they feel grateful or joyful or free if the experience hasn't happened? So most mm -hmm. people are spending the majority of their life waiting for something out there to take away their emptiness or pain or the resentment in here. Well, if they're, they're waiting their whole life in separation or lack, then, and, and we create reality, then the lack is driving certain thoughts, which is creating more separation and more lack. So teaching people then to begin to condition their body emotionally before the evidence takes place in their life is breaking a significant habit, yes. right? So instead of living by cause and effect, now we're beginning to cause and effect. So the moment you start feeling whole and grateful, we now know your healing will begin at that moment. Yes. The moment you start feeling um, worthy and abundant, your wealth is coming. You know, you're generating a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of wealth. And so, How does someone feel worthy, though, if they've always been told they're not worth it? Yeah, well, so... Let or, me or that's the story they tell yeah, themselves. Yeah. Like, I'm not worth it because yeah. she didn't say yes when I asked her on a date. Right. Because he broke up with me, because I got yeah. fired, because my parents left me. How do they? How am I worth it when yeah. there's so much evidence or story right. around a negative well, thing? Well, let's stop telling the story of your past and let's start telling the story of your future. And, and people who aren't defined by a vision of the future, for the most part, are left with memories of the past. The, uh -huh. Your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced in this moment. So most people wake up in the morning and they start thinking about their problems. Yeah. And those problems are memories that are tattooed in the brain that are associated to certain people and things at certain times and places. So the, mom, the person wakes up clean slate, they start thinking about the problems they're thinking in the past. If you believe your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, well, there's a possibility that your past is gonna be your future. Mm. Every one of those problems has an emotion associated with it. So then the moment you start recalling the problem, you start feeling unhappy, now your body's in the past because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. And how you mm -hmm. think and how you feel creates a state of being. So people reaffirm their identity based on the past, right? And it turns out that wow. the redundancy of doing that, conditioning only requires, requires an image and an emotion. And most people are unconsciously conditioning their body into the familiar past, into the known. So now if you're in the familiar past and in the known, you're gonna crave the predictable future, right. right? That's the known as well. And there's only one place where the unknown exists and that's the eternal present moment. That's mm. the sweet spot of the generous present moment. So you gotta, you gotta labor to get that person beyond the emotions that keep them tacked or anchored to the past. And yes, it takes an effort to do that. But if you keep working with the formula, you'll reach that elegant moment where there's a liberation of energy. Mm. And now your body as the unconscious mind the objective mind is not believing, it's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day because you're liberating the body from that emotional state. So you ask a person, why are you so unhappy? Why are you so frustrated? Why are you so resentful? The moment you ask that, their brain is gonna associate that emotion to a past event. Mm, to a memory. To experience. a memory. Yeah. That's because they have nothing to look forward to in their future. So if you're not being defined by a vision of the future, it just means to me that you're more in love with your past mm. than you are with the future. So how do you teach people to believe in a future that they can't see or experience with their senses yet, but they've thought about enough times in their mind that their brain has literally changed to look like the event has already occurred? The latest research in neuroscience says that's absolutely possible. Mm. We know that. And how do you teach a person 
to select a new possibility in their future and begin to emotionally embrace that future before it's made manifest to such a degree that their body is their unconscious mind is believing it's living in that future reality in the present mm -hmm. moment and they're signaling new genes and new ways ahead of the environment now to their body begins to change to look like the event has already occurred we've proven that that's possible now think about this so the more you think about your desired future the joy the gratitude the uh the feelings you want to have that are more positive, the more you think about it as, it's, as a future thing happening, the more your body shifts now. Exactly. So your body is believing it's living in that future reality now. in the present moment. Now think about this. The stronger the emotion you feel from some condition in your life, the more altered you feel inside of you, the more you narrow your focus on the cause and the brain freezes an image and takes a snapshot. And that memory now is embossed in the brain. It's branded in there. So then people think neurologically within the circuits of those past experiences and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And the stronger the betrayal, the stronger the trauma, the more the body's living in the past, right? Crazy. So then, so how do you reverse that? So now, if you truly got passionate about a future, we've all done this. You get a wild idea in your mind and uh -huh. you start holding on to that vision and you're preoccupied with it all of a sudden the thought in your mind becomes the experience and you start feeling the, the energy of the future. Yeah. Now, the stronger the emotion you feel from that vision, the more you're gonna pay attention to the picture in your mind and now you're remembering your future. And vice and, versa, the stronger you pay attention to the feeling of the past pain, you're gonna create the pain in this moment. Exactly. So then, so it requires a coherent brain mm -hmm. and we now know that there's a formula for that and we've got beautiful research to show that people can do it. They just have to practice and it requires a coherent heart because resentment, frustration, impatience creates a very incoherent <laughs> heart. Yeah. And when that heart becomes incoherent, you stop trusting yourself. There's mm -hmm. no energy there. You, get, you stop trusting in your future. Wow. So then if there's physical evidence in your brain and body, physical evidence to look like the event has already occurred, it's quite possible you'll be thinking neurologically within the circuits of your future and you'll begin to feel chemically within the boundaries of that emotion of your future mm -hmm. and how you think and how you feel is your state of being. And now your state of being is living in the future instead of the past. Now, the moment you disconnect from the emotion of your future because of traffic or some coworker or your ex or whatever people come up with, now you're back to the energy of your past. Oh. And now you're gonna start looking for it, analyzing why hasn't it happened? Well. If you're feeling the emotion of your future, why would you look for it? Because you would feel like it already happened and that mm. is the place where the magic happens. So then you can't just do this, get up and then return back to your old state of being. You gotta maintain that modified state How of mind. How do you maintain it that's, when, when that's life practice. happens? Well, let me finish. If I punch it, you in the face right now, how do you maintain <laughs> Well, of course, of course. I mean, we all take blows in our lives yeah. and, and we all react emotionally, but the question is, how long are you gonna react? Right, right. I'll so see. then, if you can't mediate and regulate your emotional mm -hmm. reactions, and those emotions linger for days, that's a Years mood. for some people. Mood, and then a months, temperament, years, personality trait. So then the person's personality is literally based on the past. But Crazy. they don't know that because they're doing it over and over again, it becomes a subconscious program. So now, if it requires a coherent brain and a coherent heart, then we have to train people uh -huh. how to self-regulate. So we've done thousands and thousands of measurements. We've partnered with the HeartMath Institute to teach people how to create and sustain heart coherence. How do we do it? Well, besides going to your workshop, what's a simplified version? I'm sure it takes more time than... Well, it really doesn't. Oh. It really doesn't. It just requires getting still, closing your eyes, putting your attention on your heart, changing your breath, so that you move into the present moment. And when you slow your breathing down, you slow your brain waves down. When you slow your brain waves down, now you're accessing your autonomic nervous system. So then you train a person how to open their heart and feel an elevated emotion. And it takes a little practice. And just like a flower that, that takes time to bloom, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. takes a little bit of time. But if mm -hmm. you work in trading the resentment, the frustration or the impatience for gratitude, appreciation and thankfulness, and you keep at it, there'll come a moment where that system switches on, and now you're feeling grateful for no reason at all. Right. Now that's, that's not a bad <laughs> thing, because gratitude 
the emotional signature of gratitude means something's happening to you. Something has happened to you. Yeah. You're receiving something or you just received something. So your body then, when you're feeling gratitude, is in the perfect state of receiving. Mm -hmm. So then that means then you'll accept, believe, and surrender to the thoughts equal to the emotional state of gratitude. Mm -hmm. If you're living in resentment, you're living in fear, you're living in, in, in patience, you could say, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm with all you want, and that thought's gonna stop right at the brainstem and never make its way to the body because the body is- not feeling or because why? Because you're feeling resentment. Uh -huh. And that thought isn't, the, that thought is not consistent with the emotion of resentment. Resentment has a different set of thoughts, right? In other words, once you start opening your heart, it begins to move into coherence. It begins to produce a measurable magnetic field up to three meters wide. Now that's frequency, that's energy. And all that energy, that frequency carries information, it carries an intent. So then when you're feeling gratitude and your heart is open, you're broadcasting energy into the mm -hmm. field. A now, frequency. A yeah. frequency. You lay the intent of the thought of your health or your wealth. That frequency can carry the thought of your wealth. It can mm. carry the thought of your health. If you're suffering, you can't, the suffering does not carry, that energy does not carry the thought of your wealth. It carries a different set of thoughts. So then, so then we're teaching people how to self-regulate because if you're gonna believe in that future that you're imagining with all of your heart, it better be open and activated. Right, right. And you better know how to self-regulate and you have to know the moment you disconnect from the energy of your future because of some circumstance in your life and you lose that feeling, if you're practicing it on a daily basis with your eyes closed, then the next level is to be able to open your eyes and do it right in the moment mm. and be able to self-regulate and change the, the frustration from some experience in your life back to the energy of your future. Now, that requires great awareness and great effort, but if you have a community of people that are practicing this on a daily basis and they're connected to their future because that's where their, their mind is, mm -hmm. Um, they begin to want the future more than the emotions the of the past. So we've done enough measurements now, Lewis, to know that we can teach people how to do that and we have evidence that people can sustain it for 45 minutes to an hour. It's a skill now. They know yeah. that they know how to do it. So now they have brain coherence and heart coherence. Well, once the heart begins to become orderly and coherent, it acts as an amplifier and it drives mm. energy to the brain. So now the brain is getting more energy once the heart is open and then you're thinking a different set of thoughts and those thoughts produce different chemicals for you to feel more of that. And here comes uh, nitric oxide from oxytocin mm. and then all of a sudden your heart literally starts to swell. It literally begins to open up and there's more energy going there and now you're coming from a different level of mind. Right. So then what about what happens to your immune system when you do that? Well, it turns out we've done an experiment. Just 10 minutes a day, three times a day with 120 people trading resentment, frustration, fear for gratitude, mm -hmm. appreciation, and thankfulness. Measuring their immune response, the, the chemical immunoglobulin A, your primary defense against bacteria and viruses, the best flu shot you'll ever get lives right. with, innately within you. Turns out when you're frustrated, when you're impatient, when you're fearful, the immune system dials down because you're an emergency. It's not, it's, all your energy is going for some threat in your outer world. There's no energy in your inner world for growth and repair. But how do you turn that around? So then as people begin to open their heart, can that chemical begin to, to um, elevate? Mm -hmm. Four days, 50% change in the 120 people. Their, their IGA levels went up 50% in four days. Wow. That's, your body's immune system is now upregulating genes that are making proteins and immunoglobulins and, and antibodies that you don't need a flu shot. In other words, your inner state is greater than your outer world. Mm -hmm. So then just by doing that, we now know that your immune system is going to get stronger by the same means. Take 120 people or 50 people and measure 7,500 gene regulations. Okay, in four days, two genes that suppress cancer growth and tumors are activated and upregulated. The genes that stimulate stem cells to go to damaged tissues and repair them, upregulated. The gene for oxidative balance 
is upregulated. Anti-cancer, anti-aging, mm. anti-heart disease, anti-stroke, anti-neurodegenerative, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial. Just your body's naturally doing this. The gene for neurogenesis, the growth of new neurons in response to novel experiences and learning. This is four days. The mm. gene switches on. Uh, the, the gene for uh, more balance in the pituitary and the pancreas, the gene for the microtubules of the cells, the, the, little, the little fibers that respond to energy and frequency. Right. So in four days, we now know that you can change your genetic destiny if you just practice the inner work. We have research to show that 60 days of meditation, five days a week, will lengthen your life. The wow. telomeres, the little shoestrings on the end of your DNA get longer. That means your biological age is changing. So we, we have the evidence now to show people what's possible. We have brain scans that, that are so outside of normal that when neuroscientists see them, they're blown away because the amount of energy that's in the brain during this transcendental moment is uh, hundreds of times outside of normal. Wow. I mean, you can't make your brain do that. Something is happening to you and that person's having a transcendental moment. And we mm. now know that we can predict it, and we now that know that we can induce it. So then there's the evidence there. Mm -hmm. Then you take our community and you see people with stage four cancer, with Parkinson's disease, with myasthenia gravis, with, with lupus, with MS, with uh, brain injuries, uh, uh, with rare genetic disorders, with uh, vertigo, uh, tinnitus, uh, all, uh, kidney failure, all kinds of health conditions come to a week-long event, and then at the end of that event, they make significant strides in getting beyond the emotions of the past. Now think about this. The science says that the environment signals the gene, that's epigenetics. Mm -hmm. The end product of an experience in the environment is an emotion. So as long as you're living by the same emotion every single day, you're signaling the same gene in the same way. And if that gene is related to a survival emotion, a stress hormone, then you're down-regulating the gene and you're creating disease. So when the person trades that emotion and really breaks free from the chains of their past, and now they're feeling an elevated emotion, well, now they're dialing down the gene for MS mm -hmm. and they're up-regulating the gene for health and balance. And so the person, will you'll say to them, where's the disease? Well, I'm not the same person. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not the, and, and the side effect of that is a transformation in healing. So. The funny thing about it is the person who has the healing is not talking about the healing. Whether it's blind people seeing, deaf people hearing, hearing, we have crazy evidence now. What they're talking about is how amazing they feel mm -hmm. because they're refreshed, they're, 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 they got a new lease on life. Yeah. And so now we have evidence in our research and that silences the critic to, to show that what's possible for people. And now we have evidence and testimony that we have evidence where people will stand on the stage and say, hey, I broke my back in three places. I, I haven't been able to stand up straight. I came into this event hunched over. I couldn't lay down. And now this guy's jumping around on the stage. He's laying on his back. He's touching his toes. He's, mm -hmm. he's, you can tell. I mean, this is, is you, he's, he's having his moment. We freed, we changed somebody. Yeah. Someone with Parkinson's disease can't swallow, mm. can't chew, can't blow her nose, can't stand up. One moment. One moment, the next thing you know, <clears throat> she's blowing her nose, chewing, swallowing. We changed her body, we changed her life, and we changed her future. And she doesn't look like a movie star, and she doesn't look like she's a vegetarian, and she doesn't look like she's buffed. She just looks like a normal person. Now, the person in the audience who's watching that and looking at this person and seeing that they're no different than them, it just starts to mm. cause them to think, if someone else can do it, I can do it. So. You see the person with the stage four cancer that got the, you know, the voodoo curse that they have three months to live. And now they have no evidence of cancer in their body and they're standing on the stage telling wow. that story and somebody in the audience is checking her out going, I have the same condition and if she can do it, I'm gonna step right in that footprint and I'm gonna do it wow. the way she did it. And all of a sudden you start seeing this change in the community in a week long event because once there's a breakthrough, right? I mean, it's like a four minute mile. That's it's it, it's, it, it's yeah. in the field, you yeah. know? And, but it's not only in the field, you're seeing evidence in three-dimensional reality. Yeah. And, and evidence is the loudest voice right now. Yeah. And so people don't want to see talking heads. Anybody can see it on the internet. Information is readily available. What they want to see is evidence. 
And so when you have evidence in the scientific realm and then you have evidence in a, in a, in a, in a community of people and it, you're not doing anything that's so extreme that, that, that excludes anybody, it's inclusive and mm -hmm. we're using science as the contemporary language of mysticism. Mm. It is science that's going to demystify the mystical. If I talk tradition, culture, religion, any of those things, spiritual principles, people are going to shut off. You're going to divide an audience. But science creates community. Right. So, so by building a scientific model, I don't subscribe to any type of meditation because I, I look at the evidence of what we've gathered in, let's see, by applying this formula, to what extent can we prove to human beings how powerful they really are? And, and I think that that has become something that has mystified me because when I see blind people seeing in our workshops, I have to tell you <laughs> that I'm more surprised than anybody. I'm <laughs> yeah. standing up there shaking my head and, and we, have, we have great evidence. This, you know, one woman was, uh, she's a nurse and um, one day she just uh, uh, wakes up and she's got a blind spot in her eye. <clears throat> she can't see in the lower left-hand quadrant of, of both eyes, 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Wow. She goes to the, she's a nurse. She goes to see her, her colleagues. Um, they do a scan, stroke uh, on the optic nerve, wow. uh, and now she's uh, legally blind. Uh, she can't drive her car. She, she runs her own company. She can't run her company. She can't type. She can't use the computer. She's compromised in a big way. Now, with a stroke, you have two weeks, really. That's the window. And if nerve cells are going to come back online, it's going to be those first two weeks. Wow. If they don't come back, the prognosis is live with it. Whether you have paralysis or whatever, that if a stroke causes brain damage in usually two to three weeks, you don't see many, much change. So they gave her the, you know, the, the prognosis. You have to learn to accommodate and wow. live with it. And so she, she, she wasn't satisfied with that answer. And she goes to one of her dear friends who's a physician. And the physician says, go check out the Spenza guy. And she says, why don't you come with me? So they come to our event in Brighton in, in the UK Was together. this within the three weeks or was this later? Do you know? Oh, no, this is a year later. Wow. This is a year later. And so it's supposed to be irreversible at yeah. that point. And so um, she comes to the event, and then she comes to the event for two reasons. To listen to this, to learn how to live with her handicap. That's the extent of what's possible. And have her more mind. peace. And, yeah. yeah. And, and then create a nonprofit to help people. Those were her two things. Mm. So somewhere in the middle of the event, where, where, uh, she, it occurs to her that she could actually possibly heal her eyes. Mm. So she goes for it. She lays down after one of the meditations, we lay down at the end, and all of a sudden, like, in her head, she starts feeling this heat and this crackling sensation. Now, you have one of two options when something like this happens. You get scared you and get run scared, away. You get scared, it's the unknown, you <laughs> yeah. contract, like, uh, and your brain goes into high beta, and you disconnect. Something's wrong, maybe right, I'm right. hurting something. Yeah, I'm having another stroke, whatever. Or you surrender and relax into it. Yeah, you go and, in. Yeah. And she, she let go and she, she had the most incredible experience. She laid there for the longest time, opened her eyes, and she said it was like the lights came back on. She said, wow. I could see completely. We sent her for a scan. The Monday morning after that week-long mm -hmm. event, the scan that had the, the left lower quadrant on both eyes from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock was black. The post scan, there isn't one black spot wow. anywhere on the, on her eyes. Because she'd already done a scan a year prior. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. She had the scan. So wow. we'll, we'll 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 give you the we'll give you the evidence, but but that is not natural. Wow. That's not normal. But but how do you explain that in conventional science? I mean, the truth is is that we have incredibly powerful innate qualities mm. for regeneration and healing mm -hmm. once you hit that button. So then she stands in the audience and gives her testimony, other people are going to begin to realize that they can heal from a stroke, and that's exactly what's happening. A collective consciousness is, is happening. What is the, the moment of transformation for someone like that? Like, when does someone, because I know that healing can happen in an instant. So how, what's the thing that triggers that instant for someone to go from disbelief to belief and it actually transforming them in the physical body? Yeah, we've studied this and, and there's no linear correlation because think about this. That woman uh, is a pragmatist. 
she knew nothing. She's not wasn't spiritual in any way. She just read my books and then started practicing the meditations. Now, she was practicing those meditations for months before the event because she wanted to come and be fully prepared for it. Yeah. Right. So, so from the from the outside, you see this one one that moment. Yep. But what you don't see is the number of times she worked in overcoming herself and getting beyond whoever she is and getting into that place where she's far enough outside familiar territory, neurologically, chemically, genetically, that all of a sudden she connects it to clicks. this. She yeah. connects. There's a she starts connecting to that invisible field called the quantum field and mm. and you can't connect as your body. <laughs> there's nothing there's nothing uh, physical to connect to there. Yeah. You have to get beyond all your associations. You know, it's and, interesting. I think I might have talked to you about this last time. That I grew up in a religion called Christian Science that talked a lot about this. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it was embedded in my mind that I'm a spiritual being and that I can never be physically f hurt. Like, there, I'm not a material body that there are no accidents, that there's no injury. And it was always embedded in my mind that I can never be physically harmed or I, I can be instantly healed. And so my entire childhood, I had all these incredible healings quickly. Mm -hmm. And I witnessed it all the time from other people and everyone was always like, how is this possible? Yeah. So I don't know if this is something I was practicing, you know, right, in, right. A different, in a different way as a child, but it's, it's always fun for me to come back around now, even though I don't practice that, that religion necessarily anymore or go to the church. I still believe the same sure. fundamental principles that I hear you talking about in a, in a more scientific way. It's a good belief to have. Yeah. <laughs> and and you, you program children like, yeah. you program your children that the body has an innate capacity to heal. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, you're less reliant on something outside of you mm -hmm. to, to make something go away Medicine inside of you. Medicine or something else. Whatever yeah. it is, shopping, yeah. video game, everybody's relying on their outer world relationship, to, relationship yeah. to change their inner state. Problem is, is the moment you start feeling emptiness or lack, your brain is going to start to look for something outside of you mm -hmm. to take it away. The problem to fill the hole, yeah. Right. The problem is, is that normally the stimulation that's created from those outer things uh, give the body a rush, and so the receptor sites and the cells recalibrate. So you need more the next time to turn it on, right? So now it's tough. You buy the new fancy car, and it's fun for and the novelty a month, wears off, right? And then it's a yeah. week, and then yeah. it's a day, and you're yeah. like, it's never enough. And that feeling never goes away, and so. The only way that feeling is actually going to go away is when you start going inward, mm -hmm. right? And so, so we've seen significant mm -hmm. changes with people, and, and having that belief uh, it, it should be tested. On yes. a, uh, we should test our belief around that. And, and my lesson through all of this is that I'm starting to realize how conditioned we are into believing how limited we are. Mm -hmm. And as you start peeling those layers away, and you break through those beliefs, those self-limiting thoughts and emotions, on the other side of that is where the miraculous happens. So you got to be willing to be in that place of discomfort long enough to reorganize order and mm -hmm. begin to create more coherence. And then all of a sudden, you get this recalibration that goes on in the brain and body. And then the extent of that is that the ultimate thing is you start to see feedback in your life, those synchronicities, those coincidences, mm -hmm. those opportunities. You're scratching your head going, Everything's falling into place. Yeah, I'm in the right place at the Everything right time. Everything I think about just comes to me. Because your energy is synchronized. Yeah. It's, you, look, I mean, when you have coherence in the brain and heart, you have a laser of energy and it could read information much better. You're living in stress and your brain is shifting its attention from one person to another problem, to another thing, to another uh, place to go. Each one of those things, there's an assignment of neurological networks in the brain. So the arousal of the stress hormones drives the brain yeah. into this high frequency and you're trying to control and predict everything in your life. And those, your brain circuits are firing like a, like a lightning storm in the clouds. When your brain's incoherent, you're incoherent. And, mm -hmm. and you, can't, you don't have a signal. You're, you, you're not have a Wi-Fi signal. You're not connected to the field. How could, you, how could you connect to energy and information if your signal hasn't become orderly? Mm. So that when people synchronize their energy into coherence, they can synchronize to a possibility in the future. And the synchronicities that are feedback from the environment are just a reflection of your energy. Mm -hmm. And that's the universe saying, follow the breadcrumbs. Do it again. Follow it again. 
do it again. And now all of a sudden the person's not waking up in the morning like, oh, I gotta meditate now to create my future. They're, they're kind of going like, I'm getting out of bed because I don't yeah. want the magic to end, right? right. They, wanna, they wanna sustain that state so that the old reality that they've lived in begins to transform into something new and because there's no longer a vibrational match with everyone and everything in their past, present reality, mm -hmm. there's a vibrational match to their future and mm -hmm. now their future is starting to give them signals. Do our, what's more powerful than our thoughts or our, our emotions? And do our emotions change our thoughts or do our thoughts change our emotions? Yeah, the answer is yes. The answer is both. I mean, um, thoughts uh, to me produce an electrical charge in the quantum field and feelings produce a magnetic charge in the quantum field. Mm. Thoughts, wait, thoughts produce a what? An electrical charge. Okay. And feelings produce a magnetic charge. And how you think and how you feel broadcasts an electromagnetic signature that influences every single atom in your life. The thought sends the signal out. Now think about this. And the feeling draws the event back. So you mm. could have the intent that you want wealth, you want health, you want success. That's your intent, that's your thought. But if you're waiting for the experience to happen, to feel it, then you're not drawing the experience to you because you're not feeling the emotion, right? So then teaching people once again how to balance their thoughts and feelings because you can, you can enter that cycle either place. Sometimes we do a meditation, we start opening our heart, we start elevating the body's energy, and then those emotions can drive certain thoughts of your future. Mm -hmm. Other times, you open your awareness, you create brain coherence, you have the vision of your future, you begin to emotionally experience it. However you wanna jump on that cycle, uh, and then sustain it, because the longer you're conscious of that energy, the more you're drawing your future to you. So then, most people spend their lives, right? They we live in this realm called space-time, three-dimensional reality, and you move your body through space in three-dimensional reality, it takes time. Yeah. So everything, all your goals, all your dreams, all your visions, you're gonna have to get your body up and drag it through space every day to pay off that, you know, that home that's in your future, right? Right. When you create from the field instead of from matter, when there's a vibrational match between your energy and some potential, and your thoughts and feelings are coherent, now you are going to begin to collapse time and space or the experience is gonna be drawn to you. Now, now you're the vortex to your destiny and now you don't have to go anywhere to get it because you're not playing by the rules of three-dimensional reality, you're playing by the rules of energy and the quantum. Mm. So teaching people how to do this and getting better at it, then all of a sudden they're not forcing and controlling outcomes, in fact they're trusting and surrendering to outcomes because they don't want to get in the way because the moment you start trying to predict when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen, you're overlaying a known over a place where there should be an unknown, right? So teaching people how to do that means we have to lay down the very thing we used our whole life to get what we want for something greater mm -hmm. to occur, mm -hmm. right? And so that transcendental moment is something that we're working on demystifying and, and you could be gluten-free person, you could be a gluten-full person. You could drink wine, not drink wine. Right. You could be rich, you could be poor, you could be any color, any shape, any size. In fact, you can't tell me you're too old to do this work. You can't tell me that. We got elders in this work that we, we show you their brain scans and you'd be blown away. Mm -hmm. they, they, they know how to do it. You can't tell me you're too sick to do this work. We got people that have reversed stage four cancer numerous times and, and yeah, it took a Herculean effort to do it, but they love themselves for it. You can't tell me that you're too out of shape or too overweight or too underweight. You can't, I've seen it in all shapes and sizes. You can't even tell me that you had a brutal past. I mean, people that have had very, very mm -hmm. dismal pasts that are free, that are happy people. You can't even tell me you're, you never meditated before. In fact, our research shows that many people have never meditated before have the most profound experiences because they're not trying to make anything happen. Yeah. They're just following the instructions, yeah. right? And, and they don't have a habit of doing it. So, so, we don't want to exclude anybody in the process. We want to include everybody. So it turns out that our events tend to draw a, a good portion of men because of mm. the science. Mm. Uh, we have a lot of children now, that are, you know, teenagers that are coming and people in their 20s. We have a great community of elders. We have, uh, you know, in our events sometimes 63 different 
cultures wow. coming to uh, uh, to countries coming to our events of between 50 and you know 65 so so we want to we want to make it so inclusive that community becomes the side effect because yeah. because with a community of like-minded like like en- similar energy of, of people uh, everybody understands they get one another you yeah. know you you Communities tends to be the thing now that, in terms of our uh, social media and, and uh, the feedback we're getting, everybody wants more community because you get a you get a thousand people in the audience and their energy is synchronized. Now you're looking at something so much bigger. We're just going to measure this. I just talked to a researcher yesterday. We're going to measure a thousand people when they reach that synchronized moment when they're we can we know that the entire social coherence in the room is orderly. Then if you're producing a ambient, coherent magnetic field in your heart and you're tuning into a thought or an intent and you got a thousand people doing that and your energy is going to start interfering mm-hmm. and co-mingling with the person who's next to you, when that energy starts to synchronize, it's going to produce a bigger wave. Mm-hmm. The higher the amplitude, the higher the wave, the more energy there is. So now you have one mind and one heart. And now when it comes to healing others, and we've done the research on this now, and we're collecting the data that we're teaching people how to administer a change in energy in the person that's laying there. Because it's not matter that emits a field. That's the wrong way to think about it. It's the field that creates matter. You change the field, you change matter. You're not, mm-hmm. It's not your job to change the tumor. The right. tumor is the illusion. It's the pattern in the field that's, that, that has to be changed. So once people start reversing this, then you start seeing tumors disappearing. You start seeing blind people seeing, deaf people hearing. You start seeing people with Parkinson's disease switch on. I mean, you start seeing stage four cancers reversing because now they're, you're, you're, you're swimming upstream. You're going to the headwaters and making that change. So pushing the envelope and then seeing that in a community, when a community is synchronized towards the second half of a week-long event, I mean, as I said before we started the show, I, I'm more surprised than, than anybody when we witness some of these things. It's crazy. What is the, we talked about, I heard you say consciousness a couple of times. What's the difference between mindset and consciousness? To me, consciousness is awareness. Awareness is paying attention and noticing. And so 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a set of unconscious uh-huh. automatic programs that we've just practiced so many times that we're not consciously thinking about those. So in order for you to change, to answer the initial question that you asked, the first step is you gotta become conscious of your unconscious thoughts. And you gotta, you gotta start looking at those hardwired thoughts that, that you think every day that are just circuits that have been fired and wired together. How do we do that? Should we t- write a list at the end of the day or what are the most common thoughts we have that day? Like how does someone become aware of thoughts? You don't have thoughts? to do that. You just have to sit down, close your eyes and not move. And then you'll get you'll you'll start seeing. What am I thinking about right now? Yeah, yeah. and all you want to do is observe the thought uh-huh. because <laughs> when you begin to observe that thought, you're no longer the program now. You're the consciousness uh-huh. observing the program, and you're starting to pull out of the thinking program. Of the, thinking about the thinking. Yeah, who's doing the thinking of the thinking mm-hmm. about the thinking? That's who you are <laughs> when you're not the program. Right. That's awareness, right? Yeah, yeah. You got to become aware of how you speak, how you act, become so conscious so aware of it that you won't go unconscious and let that thought or that behavior run you. You gotta say, oh my God, this feeling that I've been living by for the last 20 years is actually guilt. I didn't know it was guilt because it just feels like me. And all of a sudden, as you start becoming conscious of it, you're beginning to objectify your subjective self. You're, you're pulling out of those programs and nobody likes to do that because it's uncomfortable. They'd rather turn on their cell phone, start texting, get on the internet. Uh, you know, watch TV to distract them from that mm-hmm. moment, and that is what they have to move through in order to get to their to, to their own personal freedom. So, the first step is becoming conscious, and m- meditation means to become familiar with, to become conscious of, to to become so conscious of your unconscious self that you won't go unconscious to any thought, any right. behavior, or emotion, and get ready because it takes a tr- tremendous amount of energy to do that and awareness to stay conscious. To stay conscious. Mm-hmm. And so we fall from grace. Yeah. Fine. You got you got you're awake, you got another day, let's go again. How often do you fall? Oh my gosh. I mean 
<laughs> How many times have I done it? Thousands, but I'm not yeah. going to give up because the moments in which I do connect or the moments that I do have that transcendental experience, what matters the most after it, when I have that transcendental moment, I look back at all of those difficult meditations, those difficult days, and those are the ones you remember. You don't mm -hmm. remember the good meditations. Mm -hmm. You remember the ones where you came up against yourself yeah. and you went a little further. And you said, I'm going to go a little further, I'm going to go a little further. Or you had a rough day and you just went in and you just, you, at the end of the day, you surrender and you have the classic, oh my God, moment. There's no linear correlation. It's just whether you're willing to live in creation instead of living in survival. And so um, you get better at it. You know, we just get better at it. And, and for me, um, staying conscious and staying aware and staying present is an art because mm -hmm. you, you know when someone's present with you in your life because they're paying attention to you. You know when they're not present with you because they're not paying attention to you. So imagine this field of information, this, this, this intelligence that lives within you and I that's governing everything material in this world. It's a self-organizing intelligence. You have access to it so you better get present with it mm -hmm. as well as you can get present with anything else and just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right. It, that, that, that realm you can't experience with your senses. You can only experience with your awareness. So then people have to take their attention off their bodies and go from a somebody to a nobody. Mm. Take their attention off the people in their life and go from that they identify with and go from a someone to a no one. Take their attention off the things in their life, their cell phone, their computer, their car, and go from something to nothing. Take their attention off where they sleep, where they work, where they're sitting, and go from somewhere to nowhere. Mm. Take their attention off the predictable future and the familiar past and time, and go from some time to no time. And now if you're taking all of your attention off of everything material in this three-dimensional reality, now there's only one other thing that's left. That means you're in awareness, your consciousness. And now that is the bridge. That is the door mm. to the quantum field. And you can't enter the quantum field as a somebody. So. Wow. If someone has spent their whole life working on having the perfect body or so much so they have so much attention on their pain, where you place your attention is where you place your energy, it's going to take some work for them to take all of their attention off their body, right? Because they'll go, they'll do it and then they'll go back, let's see if the pain's still there. Oh, yeah. the pain's still there. So it's a little bit of a waltz in the beginning, but as people start applying this, you start getting better at it. As an example, we had Bond University. Uh, uh, university in Australia on the, on the Gold Coast, a uh, senior researcher took the large majority of my brain scans and they had, she had them analyzed by her graduate students and they, they statistically looked at everything. One of the most startling things for the research team was our community's ability to, go, to, to get to that point where there's nobody, no one, no really? thing, nowhere, no time. Now I'm talking four seconds. I'm talking five seconds, I'm talking nine seconds. Just like, just give me a second, I know how to do this. They, they've practiced it enough times that the creative moment is when you get beyond yourself, mm -hmm. when you dissociate from everything known in your material world. Turns out when you do that and you start changing your brain waves, your brain waves slow down into alpha and theta, you're suppressing the memory bank of the known self that keeps you plugged into three-dimensional reality. Mm. When you quiet down this mechanism, now, all of a sudden you start connecting to that field. And when you can stay conscious in those subconscious realms, when you can literally regulate and change brain waves, now you're in the operating system where you can make those significant changes. So we now know that when people apply the formula and they do that properly, now they're walking through that door where they're ready to create from. In other words, you can't create from the known. Mm -hmm. You can't create with your body. That's matter trying to change matter. And you can do it, it's just gonna take a long time. Right. But when you create from the field instead of from matter, there's a whole different set of dynamics that takes place. And, and why not push that envelope to see, okay, if we've done this, we've done this, is it possible to do this? As an example, we do these wonderful healing circles where you see these dramatic instantaneous changes. So the person who's healed themselves of some health condition, when it comes time to heal somebody else, that's, they're gonna say, well now I understand the science, I understand how this all works, I know how to get beyond myself, I know how to open my heart, they start piecing it all together, let's take the formula to the next level. Now they witness a significant change in a person's body in real time, right there. So then the next question is, okay, like this happened many times. As an example, 
the woman who was at the event in Mallorca, Spain, uh, her brother had a massive stroke uh, in, uh, in Colombia, and she went back to Colombia, and he was in a coma for two weeks. Mm. She called up the healing circle and said, hey, can we do a healing on my brother? Now, if you're playing by the rules of Newtonian physics, three-dimensional reality, you're going to say, well, you need to be in front of the, the guy in order to heal him. But if you understand that there's no separation in the quantum, that there's, everything's connected when right. you're in that place, so wouldn't that be the next application of the formula? So they go over the science, they get it. Okay, we don't need, we just need a picture of him, and that's our coordinate. And if we're in the field... You're sending a frequency to that coordinate. Yeah, yeah. But, but you're not sending it anywhere because there's nowhere to send. There's no mm. space and time it's there. You're connecting to it. You're connecting to it, exactly. That's a great, great way to say it. In one hour after that coherence healing, he comes back to consciousness. Wow. Now, that's the extension of where we're going. You see, now, now, now we're progressing. A woman who was in one, uh, who, uh, one coherence healing group is a pediatric nurse in, uh, in Children's Hospital in Seattle. And again, witnessed the amazing miracle after our event in Toronto. Mm. She comes back and there's a little, they call them friends, there's a little guy failing. Doctors hit him with the paddles, they use all the, all the drugs to bring him back, and they walk out of the room and they say, we, we lost him. She walks over, puts her hands right in the field, and this kid comes right back online. Wow. Doctors are like, what was that? And now, so we have... The, a lot of our interest now is, I want to get 50%. One out of two people, we're collecting the data in this coherence healings. When we're 50%, we're going to walk into a children's hospital. We have three children's hospitals right now that are interested in us. We'll show them the data. Mm. We'll show them the results. We'll say, we don't want any money. We'll never even touch the kids. All we want to do is just change their lives. And when we're 50%, we're going to start doing it in children's hospitals. And, and we're gathering the data right now. That's pretty cool. Yeah, well, what else, would we, what else would we want to do with it, yeah, right? Exactly. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Do you have kids? I do. You have I kid. do. How old are your kids? My kids are uh, in their 20s, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they're all older and underway. What do they think about this work? Well, my oldest son, uh, well, first of all, my kids have grown up with this work. Yeah. So you have to imagine, like, uh, my oldest son coming back to one of my advanced workshops three years ago and my friends saying, hey, is this your first advanced workshop? And he kind of glances over at him and says, I've been in the advanced workshop for 25 years. Yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? So my oldest son is one of my team leaders. Uh, mm. He's got a master's in engineering. He lives in, in Denver, uh, in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's passionate about the work. Uh, he met his fiance at my, one of my workshops. Uh, cool. And they're very, very similar. Uh, my daughter lives in London. Uh, and she's got her master's in art at the Royal College of Art. And wow. she's probably the best creator I've ever met in my life. Mm. I mean, she's just wired. She knows how to do it. And my, my youngest son is, uh, goes, uh, is getting his degree in architecture uh, at Cal Poly. And they're all at different stations uh, in their understanding, but they understand the principles. And, mm -hmm. and I've always said to them, you know, if you can figure this out early on, the rest of your life is going to be magic, right? Because yeah. you know what to do. And, and they're pretty wired for it now. And, and I've really worked in setting up conditions uh, in their lives uh, so that they can apply uh, these principles from an early age. And now that they're older, um, I think that uh, they understand uh, how to do it. Yeah. yeah. I feel like a lot of people are unhappy in relationships. Yeah. Here's and my theory. They're like, a lot of them are failing. I don't want to put that as a general thing. There's a lot of happy relationships as well. Mm -hmm. But for people that are mission driven, um, how much more challenging is it to have a thriving relationship when you put your life into a mission? No, oh, here's the here's the deal. Um, I will never work in a relationship. I just won't. If I'm working in a relationship, something's wrong. I'll work on me. And I'll bring my best. You bring your best, and we get together, and we celebrate and it that. should work. It should work. And if it doesn't, then I'm going to step back and see what is it about me, not you, what is mm. it about me that mm. I need to really look at and change. Now, uh, if there's a vibrational match, and it flows, and it's fun, and you connect on um, um, physically, mentally, mind, body, soul, you know, that's cool. I, I think that's healthy. Uh, uh, but a mission-driven person can't be in a relationship where you have to keep going back 
and, and, and trying to fix something. I just, I just won't do that. I just think that when, it, when it's right, it's right. And I'll know. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, I do think that uh, relationships uh, can be easy. And I, I do think, I, uh, and I think that they should be. And I, and I think that if you're heart-centered, uh, that's a different place you meet. Yeah. Uh, than than uh, other emotions and and and, I, and, I, and again every time I have a mystical moment and I feel that transcendental love that I don't even know the word for uh, every time I have one of those moments I think I got this all wrong it's just that it, it's it is not chemical it's electric and, and you got what all wrong well the way we view the world uh -huh. the way we pres I mean we don't see things how they are we see things how we are mm -hmm. you know and every inner experience that's transcendental experience enriches circuitry in your brain experience produces emotion or energy in the body so you start having transcendental moments where you start connecting to that field its signature is love I mean but not love like a love for your puppy it's, this <laughs> yeah, is yeah. like this is like an arousal mm -hmm. this is I don't know the other word, but spiritual bliss. Spiritual arousal. A, yeah, and we have the we have the evidence. We can say, yeah. "Oh, watch this! Watch this person's brain." And scientists are studying uh, our work. I'll say, "Oh, um, watch! She's going to pop in a few minutes." What do you mean? Just watch. She's oh. going to pop, and all of a sudden, this person goes into an arousal. The sympathetic nervous system is so switched on, but the arousal isn't like an arousal that from the environment that produces anger or aggression or fear or anxiety or pain or suffering. That's survival in the environment that produces the arousal. This arousal is coming from energy in the body that's moving up into the brain, and the arousal is bliss. Mm -hmm. The arousal is ecstasy. The arousal is... Freedom. Peace. Oof, yeah. But it's, it's, Love, it's not yeah. chemical. It's... It's, you'll feel it in every single cell in your body. Now, here's the outcome of that. The outcome of that is that when you open your eyes and some conditioning, some layer has been removed, your spectrum of the way the world looks mm. broadens now because now you're wired to perceive what's always existed, but you didn't have the circuits in place to perceive them. So then it's the inner experience that literally trans, transforms our experience of the outer world. And so when you start having moments where you hit that kind of frequency or you have those moments of love, you're less dependent on anyone to bring you happiness. Yeah. You're, you're, you're okay. You can love the person for their flaws because you can see a part of yourself you used to be that you no longer are. And instead of judgment, you have compassion. Mm. And you can encourage and, and, and communicate from a from a level of connection instead of intimidation or, or competition or however relationships work. So, so um, I, do th I, I, do, I do think that um, it's energy and vibration and, and, and I think that uh, in our community at least people who have relationships that are built uh, from our community uh, tend to be more long-lasting because they're more self-aware. Yeah. And so there's no blame, there's no excuses, there's no make wrong, there's no competition, there's none of that. There's just, this is who I am, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that the ultimate goal is when you reach the point in your life when how you appear to the world is who you really are, that level of transparency mm -hmm. is, it takes no effort. Right. You can be yourself and, and, and you know, people say to me, wow, you're, you're pretty approachable and I say, well, God, I work so hard every day on overcoming myself in the morning, <laughs> yeah, overcoming yeah. my ego. Yeah. Why would I want to build it up the next day? Because i got to face that guy again yeah, tomorrow morning. So why not just keep, you know, you know taking those edges and, and smoothing mm -hmm. them down so that, so that you're, you're less unconscious to all of those yeah. programs that are, are built in relationships. What do you think is going to be your biggest challenge over the next decade? As we wow. Get, as we get into 2020, into 20. 30, what will be your biggest personal challenge in the next 10 years? Um, we are like a living organism. I mean, the company is just, our, our community is growing so large. I think our biggest challenge right now is finding venues and, and, and the logistics to be able to go to the next level of, of being able to do it on a larger scale without losing the efficacy, mm -hmm. but without... The intimacy, the, the connection. In, yeah, I mean... Uh, we and we we've done really great, Lewis, as a as a culture in in to responding to the world's needs and 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 I mean we we hit challenges all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And and 
I was just telling my staff in a, in a meeting, look, um, we just can't keep doing things the same way. You can't ever do that again. It's just, there's not a time that yeah. doing things the same way doesn't work. So you've got to be able to grow. You've got to be able to learn. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to stay contemporary with all the new technology and everything else. And you've got to keep yeah. bringing on a bigger team. I mean, I am nothing. I am yeah. nothing without my team, honestly. I mean, my, between my staff and my team leaders and, and our volunteers and the way we do things, um, it's a it's a it's a it's a living organism. Everybody everybody counts. And and for me, when I have a group of people, where everybody leads, you know, you see those mm -hmm. school of fish, mm -hmm. or the flock <laughs> of birds all moving together. You study that phenomenon. You think that there's some leader that everybody's following. Turns out there is no leader. Everybody's mm -hmm. leading. It's a bottom up phenomenon. So wow. you get a you get a really greased uh, team that really is heart centered. That really is uh, has the intent for the greatest good, and it's not about them, it's about how they co-lead. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, uh, that that helps me do one thing really well, and that is to focus on the people in the audience instead of everything else. So uh, we've been growing, I think, for the last 15 years or more, and, um, and I think just be, our biggest challenge is to be able to handle that growth. I yeah. mean, we get, I was just talking to my team, they were, we get, over seven, eight thousand emails a month. I mean, mm. with people with a lot of health conditions, a lot of questions, yeah, they want and support. They want, they want support, them. and yeah. so we're building infrastructure. Uh, you know, we're building uh, online ways to get people engaged, mm -hmm. and and to be able to, for me, f to provide resources for people. Uh, so we're. I think the biggest challenge would just, is if I could, you know, I'm going to stay healthy. But aside from staying healthy. Is is just being able to handle the, the growth? Yeah. How old are you now? Fifty seven. My body. 57. My body's fifty seven. Your body. Your mind is what? Like a twelve year old <laughs> child. Uh, I, don't child. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's a hundred and it's twelve at the same time. Who knows, time. Yeah. right? Uh, fifty seven, man. I hope I look like that at fifty seven. Um, what do you think the world humanities challenge will be over the next decade as we enter twenty twenty? Um, back to the principle, Lewis, of just different paradigms beginning to collapse, you know, economically, politically, socially, environmentally, religiously, yes. education, journalism, the, uh, you know, medicine. Um, they, they have to uh, move into chaos. Mm. And chaos is just unpredictable. Because they're not order. working. Yeah, exactly. But now here's the challenge for humanity. You have one of two ways to embrace the breakdown of those, those, those paradigms. You can face them with anger and hostility and fear and you are only contributing to more of it. Uh, we have to see that those breakdowns are essential for something greater to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't wait for governments to take care of us. That's, we can't wait for uh, medicine to, to give us a drug that's going to heal us mm -hmm. from a condition. The truth is with a greater level of consciousness, the change in awareness because of information, the greatest challenge we have is those, as those paradigms break down is to no longer emotionally react in the same way and be victims. You can't say this president, this person, this, this whatever is actually making me feel this way and think this way. Basically, you're in the program that you're, something outside of you is controlling you, yeah. how you feel and how you think. So then to self-regulate then is to say how I think and feel is going to change my outer environment. So then mm. we're all faced with great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And we are at that point, at that nexus point in our, our evolution as a species. So then you don't try to fix that that's never going to work. What you do is you create something better. Mm -hmm. And then everybody just naturally just leaves that and goes here. Now, it used to be some people would just come here and the majority would stay here because they're clinging to what they've been programmed or believe in. But now, because of information, everybody's like, that's not going to work. I already know it's not going to work and I don't care what anybody says. This is working for me. So. People are moving to new, to, new, um, uh, to new applications, to new paradigms because it's working for them. So as long as we don't emotionally react to the breakdown that's happening currently in the world, and chaos is just unpredictable order, you know, as, as, as things move towards disorder, the novelty, 
that's being created is literally chaos. Mm -hmm. Because the known and everything staying the same is order. But as you step out into that unknown, it's the, you're having the chaos is unpredictable order being expressed through novelty. And we have to be able to learn how to take that disorder and with the application of brain and heart coherence, create more order. So you can't mm. just say, hey, I'm standing up for peace and, you know, and being, being miserable with your coworker. You, 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 you don't get to talk about peace until there's, you, you're, the, you're the living prayer of peace. Mm. Not just, we know, we know crime rates go down and violence goes down when there's peace projects in communities where there's meditation on peace. But when those peace gathering projects end, you know, you see that crime and violence and everything returns back to the same level. So it's not enough to just think it. Mm. We gotta demonstrate it. So if I'm demonstrating peace, and you're demonstrating peace, somebody else, because of mere neurons, is gonna go, wow, that person's unpredictable. Wow, they're different. It's given me permission to do the same. So I think that ultimately moving into that state of being, you know, as, as human beings, and, and, and creating unity, mm -hmm. that, you know, you keep watching so many programs on television that talk you into prejudice, that talk you into separation, that talk you into fear, that talk you into violence, that talk you into war, deceit, uh, negativity, um, you're, you're not going to trust anybody. In fact, you're going to see difference between you and me or anybody because that's what separation does. But yeah. when you're heart-centered and you feel connected, you don't see the person any longer, mm. right? You see something transcendent. You see an essence, right? Yeah. And I think if you do that really well, that kind of emergence of a, of a new consciousness uh, that's less dependent on, on all of those outer things is really difficult yeah. to control. And if you want to control a community, control their emotions mm -hmm. and control them in survival. Right. When you overcome your emotions, you can see the hidden meaning behind all things. And when everybody's looking this way, you may be looking that way because you understand, look, you've just overcome your fear. Yeah. You've just overcome your yeah. hostility and anger. You've overcome the program of whatever it is. I swear to you, you, you are going to be able to connect people and that that then is the hope of the future. That's why, I'm, mm. that's why I'm hopeful of the future because I think that all of this that's happening in a world right now where more things are happening in a shorter amount of time. I mean, if you're alive in this world and you haven't been experiencing the quickening, I mean, I mean yeah. you know, I said to uh, someone the other day, the day where you end your day and feel complete because you finished all your work, you'll never have that. And, yeah. you know, there's always more emails and more things to check, <laughs> right? So the demand has, has, has pressed us into this crazy realm mm. of, of, uh, of, of um, multitasking. And I think that you start shifting, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So if you're shifting your attention all over the board, your energy is scattered. Yeah. So then when you start disconnecting from everybody, your boss, your coworker, you know, the news, uh, your cell phone, your computer, and you start going this way, I think it's uh, into the present moment, then if where you place your attention is where you place your energy and you're truly in the present moment, you got a lot of energy to execute. You got yeah. a lot of energy to use and you wanna be able to do that eyes open. The more well. scattered your energy, the less you have to focus on pushing one thing forward. That's why people's dreams forward. don't yeah. happen because... Too scattered. It, yeah. it, it, there's no... Look, look. if you keep putting your attention on some future experience that you are imagining with your mind, your body's going to follow your mind right there because that's where your energy is. But if you're putting your attention on everything known in your life, the shower, the coffee maker, you know, nice. the, the toilet, and your body's following your mind every day to the known. But we want your body to follow your mind to the unknown, right? Yeah. Enough people get to doing that. And you could do better in creating things in your life. That We see this. Wealthy people in our work that have focused on wealth, some of them living in the back seat of their car, some of them bankrupt that now have multi-million dollar companies. What do you think they want to do with that money? They want to give it away. Yeah, give it back. Let me tell you yeah. why. Not because of any other reason is that they now know that they create more. Right. Well, why, why, if you're abundant, why abundance to me has changed. Abundance means I have more than I need, like way more than I need. So if I have way more than I need and I know how to create it, then take it. I'll create more of it. So now you're no longer holding on in scarcity. You're making a difference. So wealthy people 
that have created a lot of wealth in this work, they want to give back. They want to make a difference. And I think that that's how we're innately wired. Mm -hmm. I think we're all innately wired to care for one another, yeah, to make a difference. In the living organism, our living organism, our community, we heal one another, that's what we do. Right. We inform one another, we encourage one another, we support one another. We shine for one another, not to outshine another person, to shine to show them that they can shine. And that's, that to me is super healthy. Mm -hmm. So then I'm, I'm applauding your success because I want you to succeed because you're telling me that if you can do it, I can do it. Yeah, so, right. so there's no longer any separation. I think that's hopeful for the world. Then you start celebrating diversity. Then you're like, wow, you're way different than me. I want to I wanna study you because I want to bring that into who I'm becoming. Mm. Yeah, you, you, you create a strong community that way. That's powerful. Um, where can we connect with you and learn more? Um, my website is just drjoedispenza.com. I think that's a good place to okay. start. You're doing more on social media finally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can put out content out there. So we can follow you there. We can go to your events. You do them once a month somewhere. Yeah, no, we do week-long events. Our, our, our week-long events have just been my passion. You know, I'm, I've outgrown, you know, keynote uh, presentations and conferences. I, I want to be with doers. I don't, I don't yeah. want to talk about history. I want to make history. Mm -hmm. you know, that's me. So, um, so we do a week-long event uh, once, a, once a month, just about. And for people to come to a week-long, they have to do the online progressive, which mm -hmm. is a weekend course that they can do it in nine, you know, they, they can do it in nine uh, weeks or they can sit down and watch it in one week. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter to me, but that's the preparation. Yeah, to come. The yeah. practice. You gotta you gotta get on the skis and you gotta go down a few times before we start skiing, yeah. right? So so we've stopped doing the progressives just because there's just not enough time for me to do them any longer. So we would offer them as an online course and then and then we have the week lungs. But you know, I'm still doing conferences here and there uh, around the world. Uh, but yeah, the, my passion is the week long. So. You've got books. Do you have an app yet that teaches the meditations as well? You know, so? they're working on this great app right now. In fact, I have a meeting today uh, when I drive back to Santa Barbara on uh, on this app that we're creating because okay. we have a great app that keeps everybody connected to the, when they're in events. But we want to have all the meditations on there. Mm -hmm. We want to have all this, uh, all the things that we do there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. that'll be in the future. Yeah, that's not too far. No, not too far away. Before the end of the year. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, you shared your three truths in the last interview, but I have a question for you that I want to ask you, and that is, if you had your final workshop one day, and this was going to be the last workshop you ever gave in front of as many people as you wanted it to be, just imagine any type of workshop you're going to give it could be in front of millions of people in front of you, and it was your final 60 seconds after this week long or three week long workshop, whatever you want it to be, but you had your final CC sacks before everyone had to leave. And this was the last workshop you would ever give. What would you share and deliver in the final 60 seconds? Jeez, Lewis, let me think about that. No pressure. Since you're so connected to your future dreams. I would probably say that I've done my absolute best in disseminating information to prove to people how powerful they really are. And I think uh, when we become the living example of truth, when we actually embody this, uh, that um, there are no limits to what we can do. And I'm hopeful <clears throat> with human beings that, um, that uh, we have this capacity. And, uh, and of course, when we believe in ourselves, uh, we believe in possibility. Mm. And when we believe in possibilities, we believe in ourselves. And I think that is the ultimate belief. Yeah, that's strong. It's a good finish. And drop the mic, <laughs> walk, off, walk off the stage. Uh, well, I acknowledge you, Dr. Joe, for, for constantly showing up. You've been doing the work for almost two decades and obviously working on yourself for longer, but for constantly showing up with your mission, with your heart to serve all of us, to give us tools, clarity, peace, so that we can bring our hearts to the world and our gifts to the world and manifest what we ultimately want, which is more love, more peace, more harmony, and all these things. So I acknowledge you for constantly showing up. I thank you for coming on. You're the man. i got to come to one of your events soon. <laughs> You're invited, I'll be there. Bro. I will be there front You're row. Invited. Taking I'll notes, make it easy for you. Crying, doing it all. <laughs> so thank you for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate thanks, it. Yeah, thanks, Thanks for all you do also. Of course. Thank you.